Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Stefan Kaplan, and I am a social media and visual strategist. Welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. Thank you so much for being here today with us. I am so looking forward to introducing my guests today. Um, I have uh, started the Spin It Social Hour. It is a labor of love born out of care and concern for my photo community. And I am uh, very concerned about them, as we all are uh, for many different sectors in this uh, society, in this world right now, given the state of affairs uh, with the COVID-19 crisis and the resulting economic crisis. So one of the first things I want to do is ask everyone, how are you doing today? I hope everyone is well. I hope your loved ones are safe and well. And I hope that you are staying strong throughout, I think we're up to day 61 or day 63 of this sheltering in place. And uh, we are all doing it. We are all taking part in this. And I hope that we all stay strong about this and help save lives and flatten the curve and continue to listen to the experts. So, as I said, I am here for the photography community to share their work, to share their journey, to let you know more about them so that when this crisis hopefully subsides, alleviates, whatever you want to use, um, and hopefully goes away and we get this under control, that you know more about them. So therefore, they will get more work and be able to get back on track. That is my number one concern. So I've been a social media and visual strategist now for 10 years, and I'm also a former photo editor, supervising photo editor for the New York Times. So I've made lots of connections along the way, tremendous amount of friends in the business and colleagues, and I am just always thrilled to be connected to the photography world, and now, of course, everybody in social media. I have worked with AARP. I have worked with the Jackson Charitable Foundation. I have also worked with Encore.org. And one of the highest honors I have is working three years in a row with the Pulitzer Prizes with Dana Kennedy and her team and uh, doing live social media with them for the announcements and the awards. Highest honor there is. I'd also like to make a special mention for Sri Srinivasan and DigiMentors Group, who is one of my dearest friends and uh, Sneegs. Um, uh, everybody knows Sri. If you don't, check him out at SREE -E on Twitter and everywhere else. He is one of the foremost digital experts out there. So we are here, though, to talk photography and social media on the Spin It Social Hour. So I am going to give you a bit of a buildup for the wonderful and powerful work of Catherine Taylor, Boston-based, living in Somerville, Mass. And I wanted to give you a quick slideshow of her work. So I hope you enjoy this. And here we go. Wow, what a body of work. Folks, everybody out there for this minute social hour who are here to watch, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Catherine Taylor. Hello, Catherine. Hello, good morning. Oh, um, good, good morning to you. How are you today, first and foremost? I'm doing well today. I yes. love that color blue you're wearing. It is just beautiful. A friend of mine to wear blue, so I listen. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, uh, so you're you're coming to us from Somerville, Mass, if I'm correct, right? Or are you in Boston right now? So Somerville is essentially right outside Boston. It's um, it's kind of, it's considered part of the Greater Boston area. So okay. I, okay, I'm at home. Okay, I love Boston and I love Massachusetts. It's just a wonderful state, wonderful city. Uh, been there many times. Uh, and uh, just uh, recently had on a guest from uh, from Massachusetts, Estra Suarez. Um, yeah. You've heard of Estras, so, but, 
but it's really a pleasure to have you here. So why don't you uh, tell everybody a little about yourself before we get started today and tell them, you know, and get into your journey and your work. Tell us, please. Sure. Um, so, yeah, this is basically marking 10 years of working as a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I realized I prepped for all the other questions except for this one. Maybe I subconsciously avoided it. Um, yeah, I so I've, I've covered, you know, local news, national news. I've worked internationally, um, you know, both for hire and for personal work. OK. So, um, but yeah, I've you know, been fortunate to work with a ton of amazing companies and people. And um, about me personally, I'm really into yoga and running. <laughs> um, but yeah. Wow, we're already getting comments here. Uh, let's see who's here. Uh, oh, that's not a comment. That's somebody I tagged earlier. <laughs> let's scroll down here and let's see here. Uh, oh, there we go. Where we go? Catherine is amazing, says Kristen Vorster. Uh, okay. So Kristen's here with us. Um, Steve Taylor's here from Philadelphia and a lot of other people coming on here. Nice. So, um, you know, I'm just thrilled to have you here because I've done a lot of research on your work. I've known you about your work for years mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm really um, excited to uh, ask you a bunch of stuff. Um, one of the things that I know is that you hold a degree. You went to the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. and you also did a lot of work with the Center for Digital Imaging Arts at Boston University. Yeah. yeah. So uh, tell us about that. Sure. Um you know, I found education at, so it B, it's called CDIA, Center for Digital Imaging Arts, to be really impactful. Um, Carrie Walensky was one of the founders of the program while I was there, who's a Nat Geo photographer mm. for many years. Um, and it was all uh, people that were working in the field. So it was a lot of really direct experience. And, um, you know, I've stayed, that's been essentially my a good community here in Boston, you know, so many people that I studied with because they also had film and right. um, however, they had a non-compete that they couldn't teach journalism. <laughs> so, um, so I ended up doing some like extended studies at the Santa Fe shops. So I did, um, I did a work study there. So I kind of mm -hmm. supplemented. So it was a lot of, um, a lot more students at CDIA. And then I got more of like kind of the more um, you know, natural light, you know, journalist right. approach at Santa Fe. Right. I tell you, the Santa Fe workshops are legendary. I mean, yeah. I've known so many people who have taught there, so many people who have participated in the Santa Fe workshops. If people don't know about it, they should uh, Google the Santa Fe workshops uh, photography, and you will see an illustrious list of uh, alums and and uh, and people involved. Mm -hmm. So I know many, many. I could go down the list, but that would take forever. Yeah, so, the number um, of people that go through is is phenomenal. Yeah, so. it really is. I mean, it's like creme de la creme, as they say, you know. Yeah. So uh, your your work has appeared in, I mean, I looked at your list of work, uh, especially the New York Times on your about section. My God, I mean, how many times have you been published in the New York Times? It looks like a gazillion mm -hmm. times. Uh, not, more than 10. <laughs> more than 10. More than 10 and maybe less than 100. Uh, no but what a, what a list. What a list. Yeah, it's been an honor. No, it really is. I mean, the Boston Globe here it reads off the time, the Wall Street Journal and countless other media outlets. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things I read was that, you know, you see your main role as giving people a voice to be seen and heard, uh, heard through, mm -hmm. finding the humanity and beauty, beauty in people despite the hardship. Speak about yeah. that a little, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I'm very sensitive. I know that about myself. But I think that my editors have kind of niched me for more sensitive topics. You know, I tend to go in, um, you know, I've done a lot of work on the opioid epidemic here in New England, which has been a big thing for a while. Yes. And, you know, for me, that was, it was an ongoing, you know, there's a number of assignments, but I think that's where it really kind of solidified me that, you know, here's somebody, like there's humanity in right. every. You right. know, and finding for me, it's all about connecting with the person. And um, yeah, I think that, um, 
that, yeah, that's really my role is to build that trust with, right. with subjects and allow them to, to share what they want to share. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that because I really believe that's one of the um, main, you know, um, points and tenets of, of being a photojournalist, you know, is building that trust uh, with your subjects because that is how you do the best work. But more importantly, that is how it should be in terms of working with other human beings. We always have to remember that first and foremost, that we're, we're there to document, but that we're, we're working with fellow human beings. So we have to build that trust. Yeah. And uh, one feels that through your work. So there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I found this from you and I really had to put it on here. I've, I found this quote, I have felt the pull to document the many untold stories behind the headlines, because I know one of the things you've talked about is that, why don't you uh, talk about that, Catherine? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel incredibly grateful for the amazing opportunities I've had through mainstream media for a long time, you know, I mean, just the access and the, you know, who, you know, the people that you get to meet and the subjects. Um, but if you've worked as a photojournalist, you may notice that you go to one event and there's 10 other photographers there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's a part of me that's saying, my job is to tell people's stories. And, you know, there's, if we're all here, there's so many other stories that need to be told. Right. So, and I think it's also a matter of just wanting more time with, with subjects, you know, so whether it's a little bit more about the sea of what comes through or the, you know, depth of emotion. Right. I think that sometimes that there is a purpose for that. That's that um, isn't as on a quick time, time frame. So. Right. Right. No, absolutely. I think that, you know, the longer, you know, the longer we work with certain subjects, um, the better we, you know, the better we know them, the better also we, we get, of course. I mean, you've been in the field for how long now? Quite a while. 10 years. Yeah. yeah 10 years now. I mean, so you've done a lot of work and, um, you know, I know you've done a lot of work with uh, in the Gambia, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in Africa uh, mm -hmm. and, um you know, so why don't before we get to that, uh, why don't you tell me uh, how did you get started in photography, and what was the experience that changed the way you view, view the way you view photography, Catherine? Yeah, um, I was so tempted. Um, it, it's quite cliche, but I got given a, a, a SLR camera in high school by my father. <laughs> I feel like that's on so many bios. Um, no, but my father was a combat photographer in Vietnam. Oh, wow. So, that I did yeah. not know. Oh. <laughs> so, um, you know, just the idea of photography beyond a point and click and beyond, you know, that was very much in my, you know, kind of growing up. Um, and I, I started, you know, as a hobbyist in high school and, um, but it wasn't until later um, that I happened to be just out of interest. Um, there was the first gay weddings in the United States in Cambridge, Mass. And I just went there because I was like, oh, this might be a scene. So um, anyhow, I got pushed into the room. It was just the officiants and the people married and a few photographers. And um, I just realized that I'd witnessed history and I realized that the camera was such a powerful tool to connect with the world around me. So, I mean, it was an aha moment. Yeah, no, we all have them. And, you know, uh, that was definitely yours. I know from having read about it, um, but wow, I'm sorry, but let's give props and, and, and love and care and concern to dad who was a combat photographer in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, I might have to have him on the show one day. Yeah, uh, right. talk about <laughs> this. I mean, wow, what an ex I had no idea, and it's blowing my mind right now. Yeah. Um, so that that's so incredible, to, you know, to get a camera from you know from your family, and then to you know to pursue this as your as your work and your passion. Mm -hmm. You know, you definitely fell into the right line of work, Catherine. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. So, um. So one of the things that I want to ask you right here is um, 
What were you working on before COVID-19 hit and where are you now? Um, let's, let's tackle that first because I want to use it as a segue into what you're working on right now, which is what we want to dive right into, which is this all important project, which is called? Who do you wear your mask for? <laughs> Who do you wear your mask for? So Catherine, tell us, what were you working on before and now? Yeah, so I mean, we had presidential primaries up in New Hampshire, so I was kind of full board on that for a little bit. And then um, I actually went to New Delhi, and oh. this is that I haven't pushed out quite yet. I haven't put on social yet, but um, I was working with a human rights activist uh, who started the NAS Foundation. Uh, okay. Her name is Anjali Gopalan, and you know, Times Most Important People, you know, that kind of. Um, so I was working directly in her care center. Mm -hmm. I was documenting, um, she has a, an orphanage for children who are HIV positive. Oh, okay. So I was working with them, and then she also does animal rights activism. So I was, you know, working at a sanctuary as well for, you know, abused animals. So, yeah, okay. okay. I stayed and with 15 dogs. Wow. Oh, that I, I love dogs. So, you know, uh, you, you can't fill a room with enough dogs for me. <laughs> yeah. um, so and then COVID hit, of course, um, recently, and that just sent the world and everybody into a, a tailspin. Yeah. So tell us how you came about working on uh, on this project. And I'm going to actually uh, uh, first actually, you know what, why don't we uh, why don't I give a great uh, little slideshow I built? on your work and then we'll get right into it. So here we go. So there we go. And who is that last person in the in the series there? That was my mom. That was your mom. That's right. We always give props to the moms and dads out there. So there's no doubt about it. So it must be wonderful in in a surreal way <laughs> mm -hmm. to have your mom as part of this project and you know be able to talk about her because I know you think incredibly highly of her and have a profound admiration and love for her. So um, so tell us about the project, Catherine, and and where you're at now with uh, with documenting this. Yeah. So I'll I'll try and be brief just so I don't get too um, but you know I was I covered some stories in relation to the pandemic essentially before like in uh, in early February. And I've been with data scientists that were looking at the trajectory of what could happen with the with the disease if there was not with the virus if there was not uh, in worst case scenario essentially. Right. So I was very much aware that um, this was serious and perhaps maybe more so. I, there's been a lot of I, I feel like there's been a lot of conflicting. I lost you for a second. Okay. Um, lost the audio for a second. Uh, pardon us, folks. We're going to try to fix this. Catherine, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, hold on. I'm going to bring Catherine back in here. I don't know why we've lost the audio, uh, but give us one second, and we're going to see if I can get it back. Any luck? No? I can hear you. Hmm. Can okay. Um, I'm going to mute and unmute. I'm going to... Um, can you hear me now? Ask Catherine here to uh, reboot. Hold on one second. Can you reload? Uh, so, pardon the interruption, folks. So, Catherine's going to reload here. Sometimes these things happen with a live stream, but we're going to keep talking here. So, Catherine will uh, talk more about her project on uh, who do you wear your mask for. Let's see if we can bring her back in. Catherine, are you there? I'm here. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? I wonder what happened to your audio. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try the headphones. Okay. Uh, you might want to try the earbuds. Let's give that a shot. 
haven't had this happen. So apologies, folks. We're going to try to fix this right away. See what happens. Sometimes these things can happen. Any luck, Catherine? Can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me okay. now? Um, I am going to give this a reboot on my end, too. Uh, well, let's try one other thing here. This is a mystery. I apologize, folks. We're going to give this a shot here and see if we can reload again. So let's see here. Nothing yet. Okay, hold on one second. We're trying to reboot here. Um, so we're going to give this another shot. Um, okay. I am going to uh, uh, ask Catherine to quit altogether. Okay, hold on. She's checking something. Okay, so let's give this a shot. We're going to give it a shot one more time here, and we'll we'll keep trying to bring Catherine back on. Uh, apologies, folks. I hope you have the patience to stay with us. She's worth it, and so is her work. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Any luck? Nope. So, okay. no, no, um, Stephen, wait, can you look at the message? People can hear me. I'm going to check one other thing, folks. Apologies. Yes, something is going wrong with the audio. Okay. So, let's give this a shot here and see if I can uh come back on oh and come back on and i am going to actually hit hi catherine can you hear me now i can hear you yep i'm not getting your signal and that is a mystery Okay, um, we're going to keep troubleshooting here, folks. I apologize. Um, let's see what is going on here. I have everything in sync. Catherine? Yep. I can hear you. I hear you now. Something. Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Yep. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. We're golden. Somebody's uh, putting a snafu in our broadcast yeah the internet these days can you hear me now mm -hmm. yeah good okay so why don't you take your earbuds out let's try it without them real quick take those out how's that can you hear me okay no put them back in put them back in Okay, sorry folks. It's okay, it happens. We're gonna we're gonna trek through this, no problem at all. Handle it like champs. Okay, so I can't hear you yet. Sure. Some technical difficulties here, folks. Catherine? Can you hear me? Absolutely. Now we're clear. All right, good. I apologize one more time, folks. Um, for those who are watching, I want to do one quick thing. I want to go back here. I'm going to give them a quick glimpse once again at your work uh, on the masks, on who do you wear your mask for, so this way people can see it. All right. Okay. I had to do that again because of the technical difficulties. I want to make sure everybody sees your work. So, Catherine, why don't we resume? Apologies, folks, and tell us about this wonderful project that you're working on and why. 
Yeah, so just really succinctly, I just through working in journalism, I had access to just kind of the bigger picture and the fact that this was really serious, you know. Okay. So I was debating whether or not to go to India. That was mid-February, but I talked to some people and they said it's, you know, it's it was safe. But by the time I was returning back to the States, um, you know, the outbreak in Italy had happened, you know, it just started to spread a lot more. Right. And in India, it's very common for people to wear face masks, you okay. know, kind of in a culture where face masks were normal. Mm -hmm. So that was the very last thing I did in India. I, I got some, you know, high quality face masks. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came home. So, you know, right after that, kind of the whole world goes upside down. I and I just, I felt like there was a lot of unclear messaging, I think, for everybody. I mean, everybody was just kind of in a state of what is next. Mm -hmm. um, but in my brain, it was kind of just really simple and a no brainer, like that a mask could just help, you know, if we're going to be in public, you know, with a respiratory, um, oh, great. There's a the website. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, we had, my city now has a fine if you don't wear a mask. So Somerville actually has a fine of $300 if you're in public without a mask. So really? We, wow. Okay. Yeah. So okay. our city been proactive, mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, when it first started, I just saw so many people, essential workers, people on the street, you know, so many people without masks. Mm -hmm. And it just, I don't know, for me, it, was, it just caused panic. Mm -hmm. and it was upsetting. Okay. So I found a way to buy masks online and safely distribute them. So wow. I went to, you know, Walgreens or out, you know, I just found, I just <laughs> keep them in my car and mm -hmm. I would just give them away. So that was kind of the genesis of it, um, was my own kind of preoccupation with masks. And I started wearing a mask early, like when I first started traveling back from India, so March 2nd. And people would look at me strange and people would, you know, um, you know, it, it was, you know, it was not normal at that time, but I felt like it was pretty logical. Right, right. So, um, yeah, so anyhow, I just through talking with some friends, you know, I was very cautious. I didn't want to be, you know, I really kept a distance, like, you know, no social distance hangout or anything like that for over a month. But then I started talking to friends and realizing, you know, like we can celebrate this. We can encourage this. We can, you know, give our reasons why we choose to wear a mask. And, and as masks are, there's some, you know, they're symbolic of something much larger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, so you, I mean, they're so personal. Right. So I created just kind of a template. And I ask everybody the same basic questions. So I ask them, you know, what's been the most challenging aspects of COVID for them? Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any unexpected positives? And who do you wear a mask for? So, um, you know, I'm trying to. You know, so I, 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 it's all set up in my backyard. Um, right. It's all outdoors. It's all, you know, safe social distancing. Um, but I basically set up a studio in my backyard. So, um, yeah. No, I think it's great because, you know, your portraits are really powerful because, you know, portraits are windows to the soul, as I always say. And the way you're capturing people, and the way you're, I know that there's a lot of uh, interview questions that go along with this, and that's really important for people to know about. By mm -hmm. the way, um, this is the uh, site, masksofboston.com. Uh, mm -hmm. I apologize, I did not make a banner for this one, but people should uh, check it out, masksofboston.com. And you just set this up just the other day, correct, Catherine? Yeah, it's been a little Am I the first one to put it out there for you? Yeah, you are. Thank I'm you. On, I'm honored. I'm honored. <laughs> yes, and we're adding many more stories. Um, so it, it's a work in progress. But, I mean, it, I've just found it really inspiring to hear people's reflections. And I feel like the longer we kind of are in this, people, you know, people have tended to give me a little bit more philosophical or, you know, I mean, like the questions are just going a little bit deeper. So, and that's not necessarily always the case, but um, yeah, I mean, just, just the fact that people have been so willing to, 
you know, share and be vulnerable with me is amazing. So right. Right. No. Well, by the way, Rabinder says, if you happen to come to India, you're welcome to be his guest. He is a, a colleague and a friend. Uh, uh, Rabinder has been in uh, some social media groups that uh, I've been working on with live streaming. And uh, he's a wonderful gentleman. So you already have another invite in India. <laughs> Thank you, Rabinder. <laughs> okay, so Kwila, who is a social media maven out there she is all over social media and twyla is one of the best people i know in life she's so incredible twyla asks example of the questions please so what i'm going to do is show here on your website for example if you look over cynthia monasterios here 40 years old director of academic info systems and super mom if you click on cynthia oops um yep you just scroll yeah. down so if you click on it's a very beautiful site by the way if you click on her and then you see the portrait, um, is that her son? Yes, that's Dante. Oh, good, Don, what a beautiful name. And if you scroll down here, you get the questions, Twyla, and you get the answers, which are really, really uh, pretty in depth here within reason. So tell us how you went about that. Rather than just doing the portraits, you went mm -hmm. ahead and you actually took the time to question people and then put them on the website so that people could really follow up on all of this. Right. So, um, I mean, I see this very much as a part, you know, documenting history. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is unprecedented times and, you know, everybody is uniquely different. So um, I found that for me, text and, um, and imagery go really well together, probably being in, a, in editorial work for a long time. But I have just found that it allows people to um express themselves in a right. way that i can't necessarily through a photograph so right. and it kind of adds to it so. right no i mean i really love you've covered the gamut you know many different people from many different walks of life now um um tell us i know you've had people uh you've put the questions online not the questions but you've put the information out there online for people to now contact you so anybody in Massachusetts can pretty much contact you and visit you and you will uh, tackle their portraits, if I'm correct. Yeah, it's weather dependent because it's all outside. And I just in ensure um, social distancing safety. I have people sign up for a, a time slot so people don't overlap. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So, you know, one of the other things is, um, is right here is what is the most interesting mask you've seen um and and the funniest and how do you um you know how do you go about uh the subjects answering the question you know why do you wear a mask what is the typical answer and what is the oddest answer that you've received if if you care to share yeah um well as time goes on and masks are becoming more a part of i feel like people are really expressing their personalities with masks i feel like it's now um okay can you hear me i can i can okay. fantastic okay. um so um yes harry parker who's so a lot of this is on instagram so what we haven't got up on the website there's more on instagram but okay. harry parker makes snorkel masks with a filter at the end um and he's got several of those he's one of the characters i photographed and there was talk that he would use earplugs to block his nose. Um, so who knows? <laughs> but I found that, uh, you know, pretty, pretty clever. Right. Um, I think the most typical answer that I get is I wear a mask for everyone, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the, I think the cutest answer I got, because it's really interesting. I found it really interesting to specifically ask children in a way that they can understand. So, you know, my friend's daughter, Alma, who's four, yes. um, she was there and her conception of what's going on was that you just can't touch anybody. You know, that's, that's what, you know, that's what this meant for her. Right. So, you know, her answer was so that we don't touch anybody, you know, right. but that's her way of understanding. So. Right, right, right. How, how old is she? Four. Four. Okay. Yeah. That's a really, this is a very difficult thing for kids at that age uh, up until I would probably yeah. think around maybe six, seven. 
And mm -hmm. even then, it's it's difficult for them to grasp the concept of now having to wear a mask and seeing mommy and daddy in masks mm -hmm. and everywhere we go, people in masks. Yeah. But yep. so in Massachusetts, it's age two and up need to be in masks. Okay. Okay. And in Massachusetts, uh, every store that you walk in right now, uh, it requires a mask, I presume? I don't go to many stores. But okay. like, yeah. I mean, grocery store. I mean, I guess I haven't been paying attention to that, but it's pretty much, yeah. Right. Yeah. I love, you know, this portrait because it not only shows a strong woman, uh, yeah. but also the beauty of 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 the the look now of incorporating these into our lives. Because let's face mm -hmm. facts: if we want to help people survive, if we want to help the human race survive, and we want to help each other, then we have to get used to this, and we have to make sure that we're diligent about it. You know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's going to become a fashion statement in a lot of ways, really, right? Yeah, I think it's an opportunity for people to express themselves. You know, I mean, it's what, you know, as you incorporate it more into your daily life and realize you're going to be wearing it more often, you know, the, the sense of, you know, there's a little bit of a sense of permanence and, right. you know, or at least temporary permanence. Right, right. Catherine, I'm curious because you're very creative. You're so, um, you know, you're such a pro, such a veteran in doing all this work. What would you say? I mean, so many people of, of creatives, I would think, are having either mental blocks right now or also problems coming up with subject matter. What would you say to photographers to encourage them to be creative in this time of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know if anybody's familiar with The Artist's Way. It's a classic book on uh, the artistic process mm -hmm. by Cameron. So yeah, I was definitely frozen for a little bit when this first started. And I started doing the morning pages again, which are incredibly helpful for me. Um, mm -hmm. I highly recommend anybody check out that, that book. Um, but I think also, you know, I was giving that some thought and, right. you know, I was thinking that moments of fear, moments of stuckness, like those can be, like, I feel like those can become your points of, of power, right? right. So right. I like to say nothing's inherently negative, right? So if you're facing right. a problem, you know, maybe your solution is in the problem. So I was really concerned about masks, you know, right. Right? and then it ended up being, you know, my solution. Right. And, you know, I think just taking the pressure off yourself. I think that creatives, we... Uh, I know for myself, I tend to create more freely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't feel like I'm putting a lot of, you know, a huge amount of pressure on myself because I can be a perfectionist and I can be, you know, right. I stress myself out and it's already <laughs> a stressful time. So, yeah, you know, that is the truth, Catherine. When we're in a zone and where, you know, Jonathan Alcorn, who's a wonderful photographer out of Venice Beach, California, who's worked for many agencies, um, he, has a, a video out called uh, uh, the photog uh, the Zen of Photography. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how for him, photography is a, is a meditation, literally. When he's out there photographing, all the stress just leaves his body. Mm -hmm. All the worry leaves his mind yeah. because he's in a zone. I'm sure you probably feel that way too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, you know, there is a different place you enter when you're in the creative process, you know. Right. And I also meditate on a regular basis, which ah. cumulatively helps a lot. <laughs> I need you to teach me some of that because I've tried. And the only thing that works for me is when I'm out shooting, <laughs> uh, yeah. taking pictures. I don't like to say shooting anymore. <laughs> no, it's a little... I know it's a little, uh, little, you know, just wigs me out. But anyway, um, so... You know, I, I recently took a, a, a seminar, a, a webinar in branding and storytelling because I always like to get better at it with a wonderful, I want to give a shout out to Kimberly Wang of Ear Dog Photo uh, because Kimberly is a master storyteller and um, branding expert. And, you know, I did that too to inspire myself because we all need new inspiration right now, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. So... So getting along here, uh, one of the things that I want to get to now that we've tackled some of your uh, work on um, on that is I want to talk about uh, your work with the with the Gambia project. Yeah. So so why don't you tell us about that while I pull that up? Sure. Um, so 
I partnered uh, with a nonprofit in the Gambia, which is West Africa, and they were two years um, out of a very corrupt dictatorship for all purposes. I mean, it was, don't think it's technically called a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. but, um, basically, there was 22 years of abuse against, you know, particularly tri and is tribal there. So specific tribes were targeted. Um, the human rights abuses were just horrific. And when I was there, it was, it was really the first time people were starting to talk about their experiences because prior to that, people had led a lot of, had lived in a lot of fear of speaking out for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being killed, being jailed. Um, so yeah, it was just really meaningful because, and then part of it was strictly documentary because um, many people couldn't afford to get to the Capitol and put their story on record. And, um, you know, so I would go out into the community, um, to people's homes and mm -hmm. meet them there and record their information. And, um, yeah. So tell us a little about this gentleman here in this photo, because it, it it's yeah. one of the main photos that you will have displayed in a lot of areas. I've found it. And it's such a, such a powerful photo. The lighting is incredible. The composition is incredible. Of course, given your, your veteran status as a photographer. I mean, you're amazing. Tell us a little about this. That was um, Dauda. I always have a hard time saying his name. Dauda. Mm -hmm. Dauda. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting because I got to his home and it, it's funny in Africa, like where I was, it would be like, you know, get to this corner and then call, get to this corner and then call, get to this, <laughs> you know, so there's not a lot of main streets that are, so it was about 45 minute drive. So we got to his house and he had a ball cap on and glasses. And so we talked for a while and he, he was just so trusting in telling his story. Mm -hmm. And he was so appreciative to be listened to. Um, and, you know, throughout the course of the interview, you know, that was the interesting part, like, you know, just, you know, spending time, he started to take off his layers of the hat, the glasses, you know, just started to, um, you know, come and let me see him. So, right. right. So he was, he, he lost his brother and in, in, in his situation, his brother really would have been like a father figure to him. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he ended up helping him through his education and stuff like that. And he had been right. um, severely beaten by the yeah. government. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, it was really powerful because, you know, we're sitting there and he started to cry, you know, and you know, I mean, that's something. And the other people around me got really nervous, like, right. to him. and I was like, no, I don't like just give him space to feel. So, right. um, yeah, I just feel a very special connection to him. I felt well, like you, you've captured the moment and you've captured the, the pain and the, and the, you know, the, the story in his eyes and his look and his face, uh, with that, you know, with that setting that you're in there, uh, and, you know, well done. I mean, all of these photos are just so powerful and so emotional. Um, you just, you know, you feel their presence, you feel their, uh, everything they've been through. I mean, um, you know, tell us tell us about the Gambia a bit more um, in terms of, I know that there's a special name for it, I believe. Uh, people call it, if I'm correct, um, the smiling. Um, the, yes, I know. I, I'm totally blanking on it at the moment. It's like, yeah, I think it's, uh, I have it right here, actually. It's, um, sorry, I just want to find this because it's a wonderful, wonderful saying. Um, I believe it was the smiling corner of 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 africa something something of that nature yeah it's a it's a beautiful saying um and tell us a little more about the people of gambia once you've gotten to know them yeah. um and some of the people that live there are my dearest friends today um it's such a you know it, they believe in the extended family so yeah. you know there's a lot of communal activity you know communally you're you eat together like you know they definitely have you know i was with somebody and you know a very powerful person will eat with the person who you know cleans the dishes and they all sit and they share from the same bowl 
I thought that so was so emblematic of you know kind of the culture of how uh, inclusive they are. Um, there are different tribes there. Um, it is the you know Berkeley, the slave trade had a huge impact there. It's the West Coast of um, it's West Africa where a lot of there was a lot of slave trading. So that that aspect was hard. There's still some terminology that is used that refers to it that you know the the presence of it still is there. Right. Um, well, you know, I'll share something with you because um, um, I went to a French school my whole life, and um, I went to the Lycée Français here in New York, uh, the Lycée Français Kennedy, and um, I went to school with kids from all over Africa, uh, and um, I tell you, I I have such a deep love for the people of Africa um, and many other places in the world, uh, having gone to an international school, and um, I thank my mother profusely all the time for having sent me there um, because having to get to know them. I mean, uh, and to always hear uh, of some of the problems and the genocide and the horrors that go on in certain parts of Africa is just heartbreaking. Yeah, it really is. So tell us a little about this powerful photo here. Um, so he had been detained by, so he was part of the, uh, essentially the op opposition party. And there had been a peaceful protest um, because there was, the government was trying to manipulate the ballots in terms of who could be elected. So um, he went to the, he went to the rally and he was held, um, he was captured. He was, you know, um, unlawfully detained for eight to nine months. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was only released because Yahya Jameh, the you know former um, president, was exiled. But he wouldn't, you know, he was he was expecting to die in prison. Um, you know, yeah. he was tortured. He was beaten to unconscious. He, he just suffered an incredible amount. So, yeah. so let me ask you a question. Uh, having done all this documentary work on the Gambia and it and its beautiful people and all the things that they've suffered through with this. How long were you there for uh, before you became really comfortable in the environment and being able to take this to a new level as we all do as photographers, getting to know the subject matter and the subjects at hand? Yeah, that, I mean, it was a quick learning curve. So I was there for a couple months. Um, so, and kind of, you know, jumped full, full board in when I got there. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think partnering with other organizations because, you know, can be really helpful in that regard. Right. Um, so initially I was kind of connected with certain people that were willing to tell their stories and then organically it grew where, you know, you meet somebody and they know somebody else. And um, but yeah, I don't feel like I ever fully adjusted. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, I mean, there's just I just felt like literally take my reality and flip it on its head. And that's where I landed, you know, I mean, just such yeah. a different way of life and a different, right. you know, different pace, different languages, you know, multiple dialects. Right, right. Well, it's it's heartwarming to know that you've become so connected and uh, you said you have such dear friends there now and that, you know, um, and stay in touch with them and everything else. Um, how many, do you stay in touch with many of the subjects? Um, some of them I do, not all of them. Of so, course. and a lot. I mean, some people didn't have phone. You know, I mean, like there was, there's a huge, you know, um, and a lot of them, you know, don't necessarily have smartphones. It's some, a lot of people use WhatsApp, but not everyone. You know, that's a very interesting thing you say about social media. And let's dive into a few things here about social media while we're at it. Um, hold on one second. I am going to. Uh, Take that off here. By the way, check out a powerful portfolio piece of Catherine's work, The Gambia, Untold Stories with Catherine Taylor, by simply Googling The Gambia at Safari254. That is the article I was showing with that incredible spread that they gave you, which is so important because I can't stand. Online, there is really unlimited space. Sure. So yeah. it's wonderful when a place like uh, an online uh, 
uh, source as Safari 254 takes the time to curate the proper photos and put them on such a big spread and show off the work that's so well deserved yeah. about your hard work, you know? They did an amazing job and it, you know, absolutely. They absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, um, so one of the things that I was going to uh, talk to you about with social media is you mentioned WhatsApp. You know, it's interesting that you bring up WhatsApp because yeah. WhatsApp is so underused in the States here, but it's so huge out of the United States. Yeah, nobody texts outside the U.S. Right. <laughs> Right. Right. Everybody's on WhatsApp. So. Everybody's on WhatsApp. And I am on WhatsApp. And yeah. it's great because I have it synced with my computer yeah. and I can actually now read it on my desktop. Yeah. So it's really great. And it's powerful. It's very powerful. Absolutely. Much better than texting. I encourage everybody to go to WhatsApp and I don't own stock. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so let me ask you, um, let's see here. Uh, we went through that. How did you you know, become interested in documenting human rights issues? And how did you discover that that was your primary interest? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that really going back to what I was saying, I got kind of, you know, pretty involved in the opioid epidemic in, um, you know, in the New England area. And, you know, I think that was my first aha moment with mm -hmm. you know, human rights work, because to me, that was human rights. You know, there's a lot of, you know, um, I think there's a lot of, you know, pe people want to look away from addiction and, um, and so, you know, for me just finding, you know, being able to tell people's stories within that. So. Right. No, absolutely. I want to find the, um, the part about, uh, the, uh, opioid crisis that you covered. I, uh, had it loaded and it disappeared. So give me one second here. Um, yeah, I don't think, I mean, it, it's linked in my bio and then uh, it's linked in my articles. Right. The one thing I do like about your, about your site, by the way, is tell us about this, uh, and, and I'll find something on that while you're telling us about this, uh, about how you use, uh, this, um, let me, um, go to it here. I think I need to stop sharing again and I need to go to share screen and go here and I want to go to here because I want to show everybody this. I love this flip card feature on your on your blog, which yeah. is also on your website and then you can get to your blog. Uh, tell us about this. I've never seen this before and I love the way you can flip through it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's the that's the beauty of being a photographer is that you're selling, you know, like the images are what tell the story. So, um, I, you know, you can, you can view that in many different ways. So I typically actually view it through the magazine model, I think it's called. Um, but, right. you know, so, but yeah, it just, it's easy access and the blog I have been, it's, it's hard to keep up with everything, blog, Instagram, Facebook, you know, <laughs> site. So I was like, oh, it's actually probably a good project for me to do. But right. um, yeah, it's, it's just the blog, I think is a great way to just, you know, give a little more in depth on you know stories that you know you can, aren't necessarily going to be on your your website. So. No, surely, surely. Um, so here, I finally located a couple of uh, one of the subject uh, subjects that you documented and that you worked with. I mean, tell us a little more about the opioid crisis that you covered and the whole problem uh, that you know that's been going on with that and and this uh, subject in particular. Yeah. Um, so Joe, I met him, um, I just met him chatting and, um, I forget what exactly sparked the, cause I met him at a political event I was covering. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he ended up telling me a bit about his story and I said, would you ever be open to me, you know, coming to, to document you? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, just. I mean, just an incredibly kind, open human being who, you know, was severely affected. You know, he, he had multiple, multiple knee surgeries and, um, and, you know, ultimately got addicted to heroin, you know, mm -hmm. so, and suffered huge consequences from it. So, 
Yeah, no, you've done such extensive work on it. Um, I mean, it's it's really, you know, it's it's always so hard to, you know, to to go through this subject matter on on opioid on the opioid crisis and heroin abuse and everything. You know, I always say to people, this is somebody's child that's out there, you know, and they did not start out this way, you know, and um, people need to understand that treatment is important, helping people recover is important, and that they're not to be shunned and just shuffled aside, that we need to tackle this horrible epidemic in this country. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I'm sure, and it worries me tremendously. I, I mean, what do you think? I mean, you've covered this extensively with what's going on now with the uh, COVID crisis yeah. and the stress and the depression factors and stuff. How do you think this is going to affect so many people that way uh, with this crisis? Yeah, I've been really, you know, I mean, that was one of my first thoughts was like, wow, like, you know, what do you what happens when somebody doesn't have a home during this? What happens if you're, you know, if you're in the throes of an, an addiction? Um, you know, I mean, it just, you know, there's it's just added so much extra to the plate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that I, I can't I can't speak with any authority on what is happening now, but I think it's. You know, so and I'll, I'm getting my, this is my, I love this guy, Toki. <laughs> tell, her, tell us about T Toki, you said? He was his nickname, yeah. Oh, tell us about Toki a bit. He, um, he was just so brave in letting me document him. And he, he was poetic in the way he spoke. And he really understood his own, prop, you know, and I was with him and he was waiting for, a delivery of drugs and he said i'm so tired he said something to that effect of i'm so tired my my body needs it but my brain doesn't oh. and, you know and i don't know there was yeah. what yeah. you asked me, one of the questions was one of my most memorable you know situations from photography and yeah. i was smoky and um and i watched him smoke crack and i was like okay that's what that is you know i've never seen that before right and the other people I was in the field with had to leave. So Toki was my care, caretaker. He was, you know, in charge of me. And because this was a huge encampment, many people. And so Toki gives me this whole tour. He introduces me to people. And I felt completely safe in his, mm -hmm. in his care. So. Mm -hmm. And tell us about this gentleman here who you documented. Yeah. Um, so that's, he was in Lowell. Um, and which is, you know, it's an older mill town and, you know, close to Boston as well. And um, he was he was in the process of recovery. So, you know, I felt like the 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 photo was a little, you know, I was, I was getting a little philosophical with a photo where there's like a crossroads and a stop sign on one side. And, you know, but um, yeah, he was just starting to make a path for his life moving forward out of addiction. Right, right. Well, I'm really, you know, having asked that question, which I had right here, what was one of the most memorable, impactful moments? Obviously, it was photographing and being uh, alongside Toki yeah. and and getting to know him and understand this this yeah. difficult situation, uh, not even difficult, this this horrible situation that he faces every day of his life. Yeah. You know, so, well, we thank you for sharing that information about him so we can understand and have even more compassion for these people who are dealing with this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so let me ask you um, in general. So uh, who are some of the photographers that have inspired you over the years, Catherine? I think um, Carrie Walensky has always been a huge inspiration. Um, just the, the quality, the beauty, the, you know, being able to do editorial work that's just really stunning and you know, kind of watching his uh, and then he's evolved with his career you know he's moved into a lot of video work which is you know he works with his son but you know just his ability to adapt i really um uh andrea bruce i think her work is so emotional and uh you can just feel that in every image and um and just she's she's very courageous, you know, for, mm -hmm. for the places she goes and the the stories that she documents. 
Right. right. No, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I have, uh, I collect photography books and I have over 200 and I always go to them to get inspired by other photographers out there. I noticed in one of your, in that Gambia piece, the Gambia that they did, Safari did 254 on you, that one of your favorite uh, photographers is uh, Sebastian Salgado. I'm just getting to that. Yeah. <laughs> I knew we were going to hit on that. I, I There's not a show that goes by that I can't mention his name because that's how big of an impact his work has had. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, how did you stumble upon uh, Sebastian's work and what, what, what is your, you know, yeah. what is your thoughts on somebody as, as incredible as he is as a photojournalist and an economist? Yeah. I mean, I love what he said that, you know, like you have to have other interests, you know, like or other areas to impact your work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that his images bring in, I mean, there's such uh, socially poignant, um, you know, information that he's conveying, but he does it in a way that's, you know, uh, it's like a piece of artwork, you know, I mean, it's truly, it's not just descriptive, but it's, um, you know, he, there's some element of fashion and beauty. I mean, it's just, he's, it's, it's remarkable what he has done. So. Right. I, I just wanted to go through some more work here while we're while we're um, while we're still online here with uh, your website. And I mean, there's just so much. Here's more of the Gambia project. Um, just such such incredible work. What a what an absolutely stunning photo right there. That is my Facebook uh, homepage. So <laughs> yeah, no, it is it is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So tell us, Catherine, having traveled, having done all this photography work, what are some of your other passions in life? Some of my other passions. Um, well, prior to being a photographer, I was a competitive runner for a while. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, I, I that's kind of morphed into more yoga, but you know, I, I feel passionate about you know, I was really into marathons for a while, ran a couple marathons, run, ran like 20 half marathons, kind of chilled out right now just because of, you know, I don't feel that comfortable running on the street. But um, that I'm passionate about um, my community. You know, I've just I have an amazing community of people around me and I'm fortunate to have friends from all over the world. And, you know, I just feel I feel really grateful for you know the people in my life at this point, you know. I, w I wouldn't say cooking is my passion, even though I wish it was, or gardening. I want to <laughs> stop eating during this COVID crisis. I have been stress eating, and uh, I definitely have to start exercising more because it has taken its toll on my waist. <laughs> but uh, speaking more seriously, though, uh, having asked you what are some of your other passions and running and stuff like that, you also did some documentary work on on this gentleman here. Tell us tell us about this this and what is what was this project about? Ben was actually a friend and somebody that I knew, and you know he had a traumatic brain injury. Who's a professional mm -hmm. cyclist, and I didn't understand what that really was like until talking to him more. Okay, what the experience of having a traumatic brain injury is. Right, but you know. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we, I wanted to document it essentially who he was, you know, where he was in his life at that point and who he was, you know, um, cause there was so much emotion going on. And so again, I you know, like what I'm doing now, studio work, but with a very emotional feel, you know, um, kind of documentary feel and. Mm -hmm. He had to wear headphones because, you know, the noise was too much for him often. And mm -hmm. there's just a lot of, you know, I think pain and confusion for him. So right. did he, he uh, from the brain injury, did he develop like tinnitus and stuff or was that simply from the brain injury? It was simply from the brain injury. It was just that noise was just so overwhelming and words. Yeah. Was, it was hard to conceptualize certain words. And yeah. Mm. So, so on that question, um, so looking at the photos that you've done of him, you know, what drives you as a photographer, Catherine, uh, perfecting the craft, the search for that picture and moment, the technique? I mean, it's probably a combination of all three, right? Yeah, it definitely is. And um, I was thinking about that because I, I got the answers ahead of time. I mean, the questions ahead of time. And um, 
yeah, I, I feel like it's really technique, but not in a technical sense. You know, I feel like it's technique in terms of, you know, exactly what we've been talking about. How do you build trust with people? How do you, you know, really know your own vision to really execute it? You right. know, how do you, because um, now I'm in this project, but it wasn't fully formed when I did it. So it's been like, okay, let's get it cohesive. And, um, and also, yeah, just continuing to, I think, find my own voice through what I choose to cover, you know, so, or what I choose to focus on. So. Right. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I apologize for not doing uh, throughout this broadcast was I wanted to, I, we've been running it. I've been running it and, um, and stuff is your website, of course. So everybody should check out Catherine's work at her website, which is uh, Catherine Taylor photography.com. And also everybody should definitely follow Catherine on Instagram at Catherine Taylor photo. Uh, is there any other uh, outlet that you're prominent on? I think those are the two pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah but Instagram, I, I do Facebook a little bit, but. <laughs> no, I think, listen, you know, photographers that are immersed in the work that are out there, I always say, I give it to them these days because you have to go out, do the work, get the stuff online, uh, create many multimedia projects, write a lot of notes, uh, write the stories behind them. It's a lot. Uh, I mean, today with multimedia, the job has been elevated to uh, uh, whatever it was on steroids now, you know? Yeah. So, so tell us about your views on, so this is a discussion about photography and social media here at the Spin It Social Hour. Tell us about your views uh, on social media briefly and also uh, because we're coming to a close here. What are your views about social media and uh, what do you wish you had more time for that you could get better with? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when I started my career, Instagram wasn't what it is now. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't really this kind of, you know, place to... I was I was pr posting more personal photos or behind the right. scenes photos, iPhone photos, and I think that Instagram actually helped me look at what work I wanted to be doing because mm -hmm. I was doing a lot, but I was like, is this the work I really want to be doing? You right. know, this you know because half of the work I do for hire I don't post, you know, right. because I'm like it's for you know, and for no particular reason unless I feel really you know, really like I love it, but it made me realize that I really wanted to push myself to do the things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think that Instagram has been helpful in that. Um, yeah, no, I love your Instagram feed. I'm going to pull it up real quick uh, one more time just for people to uh, get a quick look at it. Um, and I'm going to close this out here. And there we go. And I want to give a quick scroll through a few things here because after the masks project, uh, which has dominated your Instagram feed, by the mm -hmm. way, I love, and it should, I love this, uh, this collage you've done on Instagram. And also, you know, you've covered so many different um, things on Instagram, uh, the political, the campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, I see there Bernie, I see there Elizabeth Warren, uh, and many others that you've covered. You've <laughs> So let me ask you real quick, out of everything that you've covered politically and campaign wise, um, what is it like to work on the campaign trail? Yeah, I mean, honestly, so it was the, you know, I, I got to travel with, you know, Hillary Clinton, and, you know, a lot of these uh, political events. Um, they're interesting, you know, I mean, you get that chance to be, you know, in the presence of people who are running and that's really interesting um but honestly like my favorite was uh it was during the 2016 election and got to go up to um rochester new york and mm -hmm. at the site of Susan anthony's grave site mm -hmm. and it was just i mean for me necessarily about the politics you know the politicians it was about what people what people were putting into it so it that felt very historic to me you know right um, well you know that that's one of the things that you know i mean the campaign trails can be grueling on photographers and candidates it's a, it's an immense it's a tremendous yeah. experience it's very 
uh, it, it soaks up your energy, you know? Um, I mean, it's, it's grueling. I've heard about it. I've never documented anything on the campaign trail, but I know a lot of photographers who have, but you've also done a lot of work doing portraiture. And one of the things that grabbed me when I saw, uh, going through your files was of course the legendary David Carr. Um, God bless him. Uh, rest in peace forever. Uh, David, David was a, a real incredible journalist and a legend. So tell us for a moment about him and then we're going to bring this show to a close. Yeah, so he ended up working at BU and I work, I did a lot of the mark for the, the college that he worked for. So BU um, Kong, College of Communications. So I got to know David, uh, we, we had shared a byline or two together over the years, but like I'd never known him in person. Right. And, but while he was in Boston, I got to know him a bit better and I just found him so endearing you know like he was you know he was just very personable and um he would joke and you know I mean he would just do funny things like he'd be in the middle of a lecture and he would just like wave me as I was photographing you know <laughs> I when I used to work at the times I used to see him uh working at times and he was even on when he was working and on the phone he was always so animated yeah. And and vocal. We know David was vocal. Uh, David <laughs> did not hold back on anything. Uh, I recently saw. What's that? He was very refreshing. You know. Like, yeah. Dave, if there's one thing to say about David Carr, when they made him, they broke the mold. <laughs> Absolutely. And he was an original. Uh, I recently saw a Vice interview with him where he ripped in to uh, the, some of the uh, people at Vice over a few things. And I tell you, David never held punches back. He gave you his opinion. He was a, a on spot on journalist about everything. And may he always rest in peace. Yeah, and very yeah. gentle. I mean, you can tell by that photo that he's a very gentle soul. Oh. You know? um, yeah, I, I love talking with him from time to time. I didn't know him well, well, but I did talk to him from time to time. And I got to observe a lot of about him at the times. And he, he leaves a lasting impression on you. Yeah. You know, was, I think that was very, very shortly before he passed. So, yeah. Well, what an honor to have, uh, you know, to work with him a little and to uh, take in his portraits and stuff. And you did a wonderful portrait of him there. You really... Uh, feel the beauty of David Carr there, you know? So, but anyway, we're coming to a close here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to give you a chance to do is give a shout out to some people that you wanted to give a shout out to who have been just the best for you lately and in the past. And I know who that's going to be. So why don't you go ahead, Catherine? <laughs> Mom, <laughs> sure. thank you for everything you do. And I make you proud. <laughs> Oh, mom's mom's wonderful. She's been helping promote this all week. I already saw her sharing and telling everybody, you better watch my daughter on the spinach social wow. The spinach hour. And uh, we're going on the spinach and social in 12 minute hour. So we're going to come to a close. But one of the things that I'd love to see you do more of social media wise, since I always give out a few tips, is because you're such an incredible professional. I think this goes across the board. So I always bring it up is I'd love to see you have more of a presence on LinkedIn from time to time, uh, because I think doing portraits and great documentary, document, uh, documentary work that a lot of organizations would love to hire you. And I think they should know about you. And if you do the great storytelling that you do, written and visual on LinkedIn, I think it will be fruitful for you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Oh, no, please. I'm here to help. And trading social, sharing social media doctoring tips. I coach a lot. I've lectured at many universities, including Princeton and NYU. And I teach at FIT. Uh, and uh, you'd be happy to hear this. One of the great things I'm doing is I'm having my students, which they're handing it in on Monday, their final project is to create a live stream like this where they're going to be interviewing somebody. So they're going to be incorporating their photography students who are taking a class in social media with me. Nice. So when this COVID crisis hit, I said, why not have them do their final project on StreamYard and live stream and see how they could do this, you know? That makes sense. And then, so so that's a great thing. So that, and I'd love to see you use uh, Instagram in a little different way, a little more, and do some more stories. Okay, yeah. 
Because I'll tell you something, I'll give you a great tip here. Stories get a lot of views and a lot of people, you'll get a lot of traffic from stories. That's very true. And I feel like that's, you know, definitely been, it's been trending more in that, in that direction. So. Right. And the one thing I need to do social media wise while I'm doing this broadcast is stop bobbing my head so much. I just caught myself. <laughs> I'm like a living bobblehead doll sometimes. You know, if you can't poke fun at yourself, who can you poke fun at? Well, as my mom would say, if you can't laugh at yourself, then you're missing out on some of the best jokes. <laughs> that, that, is, that is true. So, you know, one of the last things I want to do here quickly is I want to show a uh, photo of the week uh, that mm -hmm. I latched on to. This is by, at the end of the show, I like to do one photo of the week. I latched on to a photo that I saw from David Hanshu that I'd like to show. And I'm going to throw it up right now, uh, which is this one right here. And um, it's just a wonderful photo of yeah. a gentleman in Times Square, I believe, uh, walking with his full-fledged mask on. The irony of this, of course, is that he has his mask, other mask pulled down, his face shield yeah. on, and a cigarette in his mouth. But the beauty of it is he also has a beautiful flower that he's yeah. probably bringing to somebody. Tell me about what you think about this photo that David Han Hanshu shot. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it it's so emblematic of the times too, right? like that life goes on, that, you know, he's, he's out, you know, in this pandemic, but he's doing something, you know, meaningful and he's got gloves on too. And yeah, he's he's doing his best part for clearly he's got the mask when he's not smoking a cigarette. It looks like he might wear that. So um no, I think it's humorous too. You know, you can it clearly is. see that uh there's a moment between him and the subject and the photographer, you know, where and that's amazing, you know, people people are going. It is. And here's another photo to David shot that I had to share because you know what, why not end on a bit of humor here? Uh, and just, you know, if uh, Sri Srinivasan, who I work with a lot, always says on his daily COVID calls at night, which everybody should tune into Sri's daily COVID call, it's across the board on, on social. He always says, if we don't laugh a little these days, all we're going to do is cry. Yeah. So I wanted to show this photo too that David captured in Times Square because it's just a moment that I saw it and I'm like, wow, <laughs> only David Hanshu. Uh, he's always out there, even this, uh, with this crisis going on, capturing some very serious moments, of course, and these other lighthearted moments. Yeah. You know, yeah. I saw this and you can see a little bit of the guy's mask underneath and then he has this other bird mask over him. Right. I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty... Uh, Pretty funny and uh, a great moment. So, you know, but Catherine, I wanted to thank you immensely for coming on here and uh, and telling your story. And it's a pleasure to share your work. And uh, once again, folks, Catherine Taylor can be found on her website, of course, at CatherineTaylorPhotography.com. Hire her, get to know her, remember her, please. And also be sure to uh, check her out on Instagram at Catherine Taylor Photo. It's right there on her name, on her uh, spot here on the Spin It Social Hour. Please find her, get to know her. Do not forget about her. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You you do an amazing job putting in so much work to... Um you know, highlight photographers and it's really impressive. I, I It's been a real pleasure and I feel honored to be a part of this and it's great. I've known you for 10 years on social media and now we're getting, you know, <laughs> so it's been really nice to have this more in-depth uh, interaction. So I really- you know, Thank you. Thank you because, you know, the Spin It Social Hour, as I said, really was born from the COVID crisis because I really want to help photographers out there uh, I love social media. I love using social media as I taught my students this semester in a whole lecture about social good. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be the negative. As, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a great journalist, I, I know David Beard, uh, mm -hmm. who works with Pointer and now National Geographic, are doing their newsletter. Find him at Dub Beard, D-A-B-E-A-R-D. He's from Massachusetts, by the way. David Beard. I'll introduce you to him. As David always says, we control our social. And if it gets really bad, then we need to fix it by eliminating certain feeds and people and accentuate the positive. Yeah, absolutely. You know? 
And uh, Catherine Marie Holmes says, great program. Thank you, Catherine. Wonderful. Yeah. Folks, I've never said this throughout the broadcast, but we've shared it. Mom mm -hmm. says, thank you. Thank you, Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's Catherine's mom, mom, not mine. My mm -hmm. mom is watching at home on a big screen. She likes to watch it on a big screen. Mm -hmm. She's too much. She watches it on this huge screen. But I'm going to let you go, Catherine. Thank you. Take care of yourself and keep up the great work. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye now. Take care. So, folks, we're coming to a close here on the Spinach Social Hour in 15 minutes, which is better than the Spinach Social Hour and a half in 45 minutes. And I'm going to leave you with a couple of things by saying, please be safe. Please be careful. Please take care of yourselves. And I want to also let you know about two very special things coming up. One is tonight, a uh, production that is about journalism that's really important to acknowledge, and I love to do that. So uh, this is about the News Project Live with the legendary Merrill Brown and Alex Leo, who is his head of audience. And tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time, he is going to have episode number two on the perilous state of the news newspaper industry with Mike Klingensmith, publisher and CEO of the Star Tribune, and Ken Doctor, the president of News. News, um, Newsnomics. <laughs> Sorry. That's a good one. I like that one. And it's a weekly conversation with media industry experts and innovators about the future of news brought to you by the News Project. Please check them out. And then finally, I want to say, please check out my colleague and my esteemed colleague and my dear friend, Sri Srinivasan, Sri Sunday Read Along every Sunday, this Sunday with, wow, Rick Wilson, number one best-selling author. I know about Rick very well. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing writer. And also Steve, pardon the pronunciation here, Steve, Shally, I believe, or Shall. Uh, political comms, government relations strategist. Find Sri every Sunday morning online at hashtag NYT read along. Okay, folks, this has been another great week. I would like to tell you about my guest next week. The one of my all time favorite photographers, all of my photographers are my, my, my favorites, but I have a special thing in my heart for Peter De Silva out of San Francisco, who uses the most amazing classic cameras, including Roloflexes and Hasselblads and many other cameras. You're going to be blown away by the work that he does, including wet plate uh, photography and many other genres. He's just an amazing, classically trained photographer. You are going to be in just so caught up in his work and his story. Please join us next Thursday at 11 a.m. with Peter De Silva and find him and check him out. But come listen to the Spinach Social Hour next week. Um, I want to say thank you. Be safe. Be well. And take care, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>